This meeting is being recorded. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, tonight we have uh, Mike Carey, and who's going to uh, tell us all about waterfowl. Um, and I'm really uh, happy about that because back in, uh, I guess it was 2017, he did a presentation like this and I missed it because I had to go to work. But uh, so Mike a, is a retired chief of law enforcement for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and a former Win to Audubon field trip chair for a couple of years back in 27, 2018. Um, he got his degree in wildlife management from Humboldt State and spent 32 years as a game warden of various ranks, training all the wardens in many areas, including waterfowl enforcement. He retired uh, back in 2014 and then assisted uh, Hawaii Department of Wildlife in the development of a training academy for wardens and began working for Ducks Unlimited until July of 2020 when he officially retired again and moved to Hawaii with his wife, Nicole, and started an Audubon group there. Is Nicole home? She just got back a couple hours ago. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, Mike is going to share his screen and we'll get started. Okay, very good. That's showing? Yep. All right, very good. <clears throat> well, nice to see people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, I know I gave this presentation uh, before, but, uh, and some of you had, were here for that. Um, so I went through and I added, I added a few more slides, put a little more emphasis on some of the, on the hen ducks, which are much harder to identify and hopefully can add a few more tips that will help you out in the field uh, when you're trying to figure out what kind of waterfowl you're looking at. So I'm gonna start real basic. Um, basically, you know, what makes, makes a duck or a goose waterfowl and then uh, break things into groups and then eventually go individual on each species and, and talk about field identification marks. That'll make it a little easier to tell them apart. So again, if you have questions, um, I guess you can do it through the chat and uh, Larry will, will share it with me. Um, or if you happen to say something and, and the picture's up there, I can, I, I'll cover it that way. So whichever way is gonna work best. So we're gonna talk about waterfowl identification and this is specific to Shasta County and most of Northern California, trying to narrow it down a bit because these are the things that you're mo most likely to see or the species you're most likely to see. So when we talk about waterfowl, that includes the groups of ducks, geese, and swans, right? So all three of these fall into the general category of waterfowl. And the first thing I wanna do is talk about like what is consistent among all the waterfowl species. There's two parts of the, of the bird that are very unique to waterfowl, and that are it's gonna be the feet and the bill or the, or the beak area. So on the feet, all waterfowl have webbing that goes all the way out to the end of the toes, okay? They're not in lobes like this grebe down here where it has these big gaps. You're gonna have webbing all the way to the toes. You have a hard nail at the end of the foot. And then the, um, the little, we'll call it the thumb or the, the, the smaller stub of the, of the toe here. On a puddle duck, it's just, it's just a little meaty, kind of like your thumb would look, okay? But if you go to the diving duck species like this one, it's going to have a flap of skin on that on that hind toe, and that's to help them in their swimming ability. So we're going to talk about how to divide the puddle ducks and diving ducks out. And the reason for that is if you can break it into one of those two groups, you're only having to figure out one out of seven or eight species instead of one out of 16 or more species of birds that it could be. The other thing is the bills or the beaks of, of waterfowl. On, the, on waterfowl bills, the top surface is soft and fleshy, even on the geese, which it looks like they would not be. On a, on a live bird, you can push down on this upper part of the bill and it actually gives, it is a soft fleshy material. They all have a hard nail at the tip. And then they have these tooth-like projections along the side of the bill, which are called lamellae. And they are different um, shapes depending on what the duck 
or goose speeds on. So for instance, on this Northern Shoveler here, the fine tooth comb along the edge is very much like a regular hair comb, really fine tooth. And that's because they're filter feeders. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna take in a, a bunch of water and then squeeze the bill together and filter out the water. And that will let them collect seeds and insects that may be um, on the surface of the water or even underwater. When you look at a bill like this, this is on a merganser, instead of those fine tooth-like projections, you have these sharp edged teeth. And these are designed to catch and hold fish. So depending on what the, what the bird feeds on, it'll have different shapes to that tooth-like projections on the side. Geese have more like nubs so they can uh, rub them together and snip off pieces of grass or get into grain, corn or wheat or something like that. It allows them to get into the actual grain. <clears throat> now with waterfowl, as many of you know, um, they're, it's really hard to identify them if, you, if you're not familiar with them because you, you see them out in the distance. They don't, they don't often give you a nice leisurely look at them for a long time. A lot of times they're just flying by really quickly. So you wanna look for a lot of different clues that identify them. Um, the type of flock formation will actually help. How fast the wings are beating will tell you, um, like the diving ducks have a much faster beat to their wing than the puddle ducks do. The shape of the bird and the color patterns are probably the most, to me, the most important um, field identifiers when the birds are out in the distance. But things like the habitat that they live in and what kind of call or sound that they make will also help you identify what the birds are. So we have some people that are good at duck identification in the audience here. And some of you that probably are very unfamiliar with, with ducks, but let me, let me ask this question. Can anybody looking at this picture, tell me what species of bird we're looking at? If you know, just go ahead and, and say it. You don't have to. Those are, those are American widgeon, aren't they? They're what? American widgeon? American widgeon, very good, outstanding. Now, the reason I ask, and, and I'm gonna tell you why it, you, you, can, you can identify these birds. These birds here, what shows up really brightly is this white patch on the upper part of the wing or the shoulder part of the wing. The widgeon are the only duck species that we have here in, in California anyway, that has that white on the upper part of the wing. And this will show up from hundreds of yards away. Sometimes a flock of birds, they just make a turn into the sun, they, their, their back gets backlit and boom, you see that white in the upper shoulder. So that is your widgeon, okay? Now, how about these? These are a little bit harder, not as much showing, but what kind of species are we looking at, if anybody can identify them? The gadwall? Yeah, or gadwall, excellent. Now, again, you look at this and go, oh, uh, okay, I'm lucky to know they're a duck. Why, why would you know it's a gadwall? And it's all about this little white patch here on the wing. A gadwall has a white patch on the wing that's low on the wing, close to the body. Now, the, the males, it's very bright, but even on the females, it's gonna have that same white patch, low on the wing, close to the body. So again, a puddle duck with that white patch, the only duck it can be is a gadwall. So those types of things are what I'm gonna be going over as you go species by species and try to help you figure out what you're looking at, okay? Um, calls and sounds are important too, so I'll go over that as well because most ducks don't quack, unlike what you're all, you know, we're all told as little kids. What, what sound does a duck make? <laughs> and it's quack, quack, quack. It's like, well, ah, okay. <laughs> you know, a domestic duck and, and a mallard might quack. Most other ducks land up making grunts or peeps or whistles and other sounds that are not quacks at all. So the first thing I'm going to do with the ducks is divide them into two groups, okay? We're gonna divide the ducks into either being a puddle duck or a diving duck, all right? And again, the reason for that is once you get it into one of these groups, instead of identifying one of 16 to 20 species, it's gonna be one of seven or eight. So it's a lot easier to, to figure out. So the puddle ducks, what makes a puddle duck a puddle duck? Well, one thing is when they take flight, they jump directly off the surface of the water, much like a, a helicopter taking off, okay? They, they come straight up off the water and they're very colorful birds. In general, you're gonna see a lot of color on the, on the puddle ducks, okay? Where the diving ducks, 
in order for them to take flight, they have to run along the surface of the water while they're beating their wings and they eventually will get flight. So they're more like the fixed wing aircraft of the waterfowl world, okay? And the diving ducks, these are pretty typical. They're gonna be black, white, and gray. So not gonna have a whole lot of color to them, right? So that's one thing you can start out with. You, you come across a, uh, you come to a pond and the ducks flush off the pond. If they come straight up into the air, go, okay, I'm looking at puddle ducks. If all the ducks are running along the surface of the water, you're going, okay, I'm, I'm looking at a diving duck here. That's what I need to, to focus on. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. The next thing is maybe they haven't taken flight yet and they're just feeding. Okay, the puddle ducks feed either by dabbling along the top of the water, like these northern shovelers. What they're doing is opening and closing the bill, sucking in the water and picking up seeds and things that are floating along the surface and filtering them out. Or they tip and feed by reaching as far as they can with just their upper, um, their upper body going down and their tail end sticking up, okay? This, this dabbling is um, a characteristic that sometimes will, people will call puddle ducks dabbling ducks and it's because of the way they feed, right? Thinking about this, if a duck has to be um, able to reach the bottom while it's feeding by just tipping, you can imagine that most of the time, the ducks are going to be in shallower water. Okay, so that's going to kind of lead into this habitat portion of identifying them. Now, the diving ducks, a lot different, they're going to actually disappear from the surface of the water and actually dive under the surface of the water. And so, a lot of times, especially say you're out on the Sacramento River and you're watching ducks, and you'll see half the flock will disappear. They're not there, then they'll pop up, other ones will dive, right? That's the feeding behavior, and they're actually going underwater to, to feed. And so again, that'll help you with, with breaking them down into, am I looking at a puddle duck or am I looking at a diving duck? Okay, so those are the behaviors. <clears throat> the puddle ducks, we're gonna look at eight. These are the most likely species of puddle ducks that you're gonna find in, in uh, Northern California. The mallard, the pintail, the widgeon, and there's two of them. Um, the gadwall, northern shoveler, green wing teal, the cinnamon teal, and the wood duck. The kind of habitat they, that you're gonna find them in are gonna be something like either shallow freshwater ponds, like this upper photo, or in flooded rice. Um, they're, they're very attracted to flooded rice. This is by the Sacramento Valley when it's normal year and they have normal water and, and the rice farmers flood up their, their rice, it holds a lot of birds in the, in the area. So we're gonna start out with these eight and look at them now in close, um, close up photos to help identify them out in the field. So we'll start out with the mallard. Okay, probably the, the most common puddle duck is the mallard. And, you know, everyone has seen these, no matter where you live in the US, you're gonna see mallard somewhere. Um, the green head of the male uh, with that chestnut colored upper chest, and then it's got a, a silvery belly, okay? But the green head and that chestnut colored chest with the white ring in between is very diagnostic of, of the male mallard. Now the hens, unfortunately, the hens of almost all the ducks are just largely brown. So they're a lot harder to, to identify. Okay, but when, when we're looking at these ducks here, there's a couple of things other than just the general color of the body that's gonna help you tell them apart. Okay, on this bird here, the mallard, it has a blue speculum. That's the secondary feathers right in here that are metallic blue. You'll see it can kind of shade to a little purplish, but basically, it's a blue speculum with a thin black bar and then a white bar above it, okay? You have them on both the male and female. One thing that I'll point out here, what I have but down at the bottom here is the wing bar trick, is that I covered this a lot with the game wardens because in waterfowl enforcement, if a, a hunter has ducks, they only have to leave a head or wing on the bird in order to keep them in a position where somebody in law enforcement can identify them, okay? And if you think about, a, a duck that was plucked and it only had the wing left. It's kind of difficult to tell if you have a male or female unless you know what to look for. And one of the field tr tricks here is the upper white bar above the speculum. On the male mallard, the last white ends on the last color blue feather, okay? Where on the female, the white bar goes beyond the last colored feather and actually trails into the body. And if you have the bird in hand, that's very evident. And you, so you can tell if it's a hen or a, or a male, a drake, 
just from the wing itself. The other thing to look at is the, is the bill and the bill coloring, All right, On the Drake Mallards, they're gonna be anywhere from a yellow to a yellow green, solid color. Where on the female mallards, they're orange with black speckling, which can start out with just a couple of dots on a young bird, but the black will continue to get larger and sometimes it'll become almost a big black saddle on this bird, but it basically is an orange bill with black on top of it, okay? So that's how you can tell these ducks, especially like right now when they're in their breeding plumage. But when the ducks are in their eclipse plumage, which happens in the uh, late spring, early summer, when they go flightless, okay, both the male and female are gonna be this brown looking bird. And so it becomes much harder to tell, what am I looking at here? <laughs> Is this a male or a female duck? But if you think about what I just told you about on the bill color, this color of the bill is that greenish yellow and it's solid, there's no black markings on it. This is a male mallard in an eclipse plumage, okay, or the basic plumage. And all the ducks are gonna go through um, a molt where they turn all brown. And the reason for that is when, the, when they lose all their feathers and they become flightless, it would be kind of difficult to hide if you had all the shiny colored feathers on you, right? So the males lose all the colored feathers they, they become all brown and then they replace their wing feathers first and then the body feathers start coming in. So when the ducks start coming down in late August, early September, and you start seeing them in the valley, sometimes they don't look like the classic um, breeding plumage mallard. You'll see various colors of green in the head. It's not quite there yet, but look at the bills on the bird. And if you have a solid green, yellow, you got a male. And if you got an orange bill with black specks, then you've got a female. Okay, so that, that's your, your mallard ID. The next bird we're gonna look at is the pintail. Um, very popular bird, was the king of the Pacific Flyway for years as far as the numbers go. Now, I'll surpass the mallard even, but only on certain flyways. And on the Pacific Flyway, this is the number, number one bird. It's not doing as well anymore. And so um, their take is restricted but they are beautiful and there's lots of them around in California anyway. And you're looking at a very large duck, but they're long, elongated duck. Uh, the mallard is much more stout. Um, they have a brown head and they have a white stripe coming down the neck, which continues into the body. So the entire body underneath is all white. So a very long slender duck with a brown head. Okay, if you look at the wing speculum here on this male, it's basically a green color with a, a chestnut stripe on the top and then a white bar below. But the shape of the bird is, is really diagnostic. You can tell these birds just from the shape. The tail, that pin tail that they're, they're named after doesn't really show up until late November. Um, it's part of their, their um, breeding plumage on the males. And so it, it's not there when they first lose all their feathers and they are, they're brown, they eventually get that that tail feather, but it's the last of the feathers to come in. So you'll start seeing them now. If you go down to the Sacramento Refuge Tour, the pintail actually should have a pretty long tail on them at this time of year. Here they are sitting side by side, a male and a female. Again, all brown, that's tough, right? The females are hard to tell apart. But in flight, one thing that, that is kind of diagnostic is the shape. They have a long slender body and a long neck. But until you really get used to seeing these and, and you see them over and over again, the easiest thing to do is look for the male and, and identify them. Um, the wing on, the, on a hen pintail is a very, very faded out wing of a male. I used to describe this at the academy when the, when the cadets were looking at wings. Like imagine what this wing would look, out, look like if you took it out into the middle of the Sahara Desert and left it out there all summer and faded out the color. You could still tell it had color, but it's really, really faded out. And if, and if they were to hold that wing up into the sun, you could actually still pick up a little bit of that greenish bronze coloration in the wing. But it is very, very difficult um, as far as in the field to see any color in that at all. Um, pintail, they make a, uh, a trilling whistle sound. They, they don't quack. So, um, these you'll hear that out in the refuge. You hear them; they're very commonly they they make a lot of a lot of that trilling, high pitched whistling sound. And especially at night, if you're ever near the refuge and you pull off and you just listen, 
or when the rice fields are flooded and there's a lot of ducks out there, you will hear that. It's kind of a, a trilling high pitched whistle that, that they make and not a quack at all. Now the widgeon, we, um, we have two uh, widgeon in California. By far the most abundant is the American widgeon. That's this guy right here. This is a Eurasian widgeon, which this, I took this picture in Shasta County actually, um, where I waited long enough and they actually swam next to each other so I can get a picture of them together. And you can, so you can get some comparison between the two. Uh, one of the things that's consistent among all the, the widgeon males is it has this bald pate or, or white or cream colored cap on top of the head, okay? So it's white in the American widgeon. It's a cream color on the Eurasian widgeon. And then the bill is blue with a black tip. So it's, it's a very light blue, a sky, a sky light blue with a black tip on it. So when they're sitting in the water, that white cap and then the blue bill with a black tip are pretty diagnostic. The other thing is if they're far away, this black rump here against a white patch on the body stands out for hundreds of yards. You can actually pick this out when you can hardly see anything on the head at all, but you see that black rump against the white. It really shows up from a long distance. The, uh, the females, again, harder to tell, um, mainly brown, but they do have that blue bill with the black tip on them, okay? And like that earlier picture, when they're in flight, the white shoulder patches is very diagnostic. And that's probably, that's probably the one thing that's most important if you're gonna see them in flight. Now, it doesn't help you much when they're swimming along because the wings are folded up. But once they take flight, if you see white up in the upper shoulder, you've got, you've got widgeon. And both the American and the Eurasian widgeon will have that. So the white, white shoulders, you got a widgeon. Here's a hen widgeon here. And you can see, even though it's not as bright a white patch as it is in the male, it's still, it's still got buffy white. What those are is all those feathers have a white fringe around each feather. And so it shows up a, a little bit of white up on the shoulder not a pure white patch, but it still, it still has a white shoulder. Um, again, no quacking from these ducks. These, they have a, a three note whistle, kind of like a, uh, a quail in some way. It's a, it's a, in a, a low high, low kind of a, a sound. And again, you'll hear these very commonly out on the, on the refuge, especially in the evenings. If you ever are driving around rice fields or by the sack refuge and you just stop the car and listen, you'll, you'll hear widgeon and pintail very commonly out there. Okay, the gadwall. Now this is one of the exceptions to the rule as far as being very colorful because the gadwall is the least colorful of all the puddle ducks. Um, in fact, it's, it's mainly a gray colored bird on the male and a brown colored bird in the female. Um, so much so that one of their common nicknames is a gray duck because it really doesn't have a whole lot of color. So on a gadwall, a couple things that you wanna look for are gonna be the, the beak, the bill on the male is black, solid black bill, okay? The bill on the female is a lot like a, a miniature hen mallard. It's orange with black speckling on it, but it's a really small bill. If you, you know, if you had them side by side, you can tell the difference. Of course, when you see one duck, it's kind of difficult to, to tell, but it is a small, a small orange bill with black spots, okay? Uh, the other thing that I look for is the color of the legs on the gadwall. They're, they're a mustard orange. It's kind of unique amongst the duck colored legs. A lot of them are gray or bright orange, but you look at just a little piece of the uh, leg here, it's kind of that uh, mustardy color. And then remember the widgeon had a um, black and white contrast. They had a black rump with a white belly. Well, here now you have a black going onto a gray belly. So again, this shows up really well and you can tell a gadwall from a widgeon very clearly from a distance by whether that black goes against white or black goes against gray. In flight, the most diagnostic characteristic is that white patch on the wing, low on the wing, close to the bird, okay? Uh, Nicole is listening to this, but she, uh, when she went through the academy, she remembered the gadwall as white on the, white on the wing, low on the wall, wall of the wing, and by, the rhyming of low on the wall to a gadwall, she was able to actually remember that duck and it, and it stuck 
forever. So, you know, sometimes you just, something just kicks or clicks for you and it makes it a little bit easier to remember um, how to how to tell one duck from the other. Okay, so those are your gadwall. The Northern Shoveler, well, it's called a shoveler because it's named after that huge bill that it has. The, uh, the bill on the shoveler is a spoon-shaped bill. And in fact, um, you'll hear them called spoonies because of that. Uh, really, really large bill. In fact, the, the bill is as long as the head. If you, if you look at the length of the entire bill, if you fold this back over, it's, it's, the exact, <laughs> it's the exact size of the head. So it's an extremely large bill. And actually, when, when you see these in flight, the, they actually look like the, the, the um, head is tilted down slightly, almost like the bill is too heavy to lift up. You'll see them in flight and you'll see the low hanging um, bill on these birds. The other thing is the color pattern, especially on these male uh, northern shovelers, you have a dark green head, a white upper chest and a dark belly and the dark light dark coloration stands out really far out. They can be three, 400 yards away. You see that dark white dark pattern, it's a northern shoveler. Okay, the, uh, the shovelers have a blue shoulder patch, unlike the widgeon which had white. These have a, it's kind of a light blue colored shoulder patch and then a green speculum. Um, the blue shoulder patch does show up in flight um, and, it, and, and it's definitely blue, okay? For those of you that want just a little bit more identification, the only other ducks that you're gonna see with a blue shoulder is gonna be a cinnamon teal or a uh, blue wing teal, okay? Uh, but one of the things is on the Northern Shoveler, the, um, the primaries, the, the last 10 feathers of the wing, the shafts of the primaries are bright white, where on the other, the two teal, uh, the cinnamon teal and the blue wing teal, the shafts on the primaries are actually a gray color. So that also, also shows up in, in good lighting conditions. But again, that's getting, diving into it really deeply. Main thing is large bill, dark white, dark color pattern, and you're gonna, you're gonna have your shoveler. Okay, and then our green wing teal. This is the smallest puddle duck that we have. Um, the green wing teal, this is a very, very common duck on, in our flyway. Uh, there's lots of them that go through the Sacramento Valley all the time. The uh, male is really easy to tell apart because it's got that chestnut head with a green eye stripe, all right? The, the big stripe going right through the center of the head. Um, the chest is kind of a, uh, yeah, a little golden chestnut color with black speckling on it. And the rump patch on this bird is that kind of that orangey, orangey buff color. So that is unique to the green wing teal. But again, the really small, really small ducks, they're pretty, pretty easy to tell. Females are all brown, but you can tell where it gets its name. The speculum is, is bright metallic green. So that's where it gets the green wing uh, name on the teal. These birds are um, very commonly, they're in huge flocks like this flock here. And when you see them in flight, they, um, they have an undulating type flight where they're, they, they come up and down as they, they fly across the landscape and they're not a straight line or they're not in a classic V. They're in the big clusters they'll pack up really tight and they'll open up and, and really tight formation flying in an undulating type of a, of a flock. They make a single peep sound, one note, really high pitched um, peep. But when you hear a flock of them, you're hearing several of them making that peeping sound. So it kind of, it's like a beep, 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 beep. These little uh, really high pitched beep, beeping or peeping sound. So that's your, uh, that's your green wing teal. The other teal that we have are the cinnamon and the blue wing. Now we don't have a lot of blue wing teal. In fact, early on, when I started talking about duck ID when I first got hired in the in the early 1980s. We didn't even talk about the blue wing teal, but they they seem to be becoming a little bit more commonly found. Um, if there's a lot of ducks in the area and a lot of teal, you occasionally will find them. So I actually have added them into a something you're likely to see now. Maybe not in large numbers, but you can run into them fairly common. So the cinnamon teal is really easy because the male is a cinnamon red color from the head all the way through the whole body. 
All right, the whole, it's a bright red cinnamon color and uh, they're gorgeous. The female, okay, we're talking about a brown duck again, but it does have blue on the shoulder. And if you see them flying together with cinnamon teal, that you're the male with that cinnamon color, that's gonna be the most helpful um, diagnostic feature of them. In low light, you're not gonna see the red, but you will see an extremely dark singular colored bird, a small, all dart bird with a very fast wing beat uh, for the for the teal they their wing beats are faster than all the bigger ducks they're getting close to the speed of a diving duck um, but as you get light you will pick up the uh the blue shoulder patches um the the blue wings the males are, are really cool because they've got this crescent shaped white patch between the eye and the bill but their wings are almost identical to the uh to the cinnamon teal so it's very difficult to tell a, a hen cinnamon teal from a hen blue wing teal unless you actually have it in, in hand. Uh, the differences are one has a slightly wider bill <laughs> and how are you going to know that if you're looking at one duck, right? It's just, it's almost impossible. So, you know, I, I've always felt that if you see, if you can identify the males, I would say you got a 90% plus chance that the female flying with them is going to be that species, and mostly, you're looking at cinnamon teal um, with a rare, occasional blue wing. So those are those are the rest of your teal. The wood duck is kind of a class all on of its own. Um, wood ducks are pretty pretty hard to miss just because of the sheer color of them. Okay, the the most colorful of all of our ducks, and what's really unique about them is their iridescent feathers. Not only are they colorful. But they're iridescent. You can, if, if the bird's moving, it'll actually shine light back at you, much like the, the speculum on all of the puddle ducks. The entire bird has a sheen about it. Um, and even the, the, the hens, you can see a little bit of it here in the shine on the back. That iridescent color is only found in the bodies of the, of the wood ducks. Um, in the water, you'll see a, a female wood duck has a really big white eye ring. Okay. Um, the males, you're not going to miss this for anything else. The red eye with the big red eye ring, extremely colorful. Um, they are wood ducks. They do like to hang around where there's lots of trees or small creeks. They are cavity nesters, so they will they'll nest in the cavity of trees. And one of their favorite foods is acorns. So that's an interesting thing for a duck. Um, kind of like our, uh, our banjo pigeons, they love eating acorns as well. And when a bird is feeding on acorns, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, if you ever run into to one or you can see it up close, it looks like it has a disease because it's got all the acorns in its crop. Um, and, it, and it can really bulge out because they can put several of them in the, in the crop. And then, and then eventually they one by one will, will slide them into the gizzard, which will grind them up and, and allow them to eat them. Um, another duck that doesn't quack. Okay, they have a, a, a very unique whistling sound that I, I can't duplicate. Um, but they, uh, once you hear one, <laughs> and you can go online and, and pick wood duck sound and actually pick up that sound, they're, they, uh, it's a really, really unique high-pitched whistle. Um, but these are, these are easy to tell mainly because of the, of the colors and the habitat. Uh, freshwater ponds surrounded by a lot of trees or little creeks things like that that's where most of the wood ducks are going to be found hey mike um yeah. with the uh with the the crop do you, i mean i know the the pigeons have that but does a wood duck actually have a a crop for grinding acorns swallowed whole or they, they can hold them they hold them in their in their throat and their neck area so it may not be like developed like a pigeon is uh -huh. but they will slide them in and it'll get ground into the gizzard. So that's how they're able to, to handle acorns. Wow. Huh. Yeah, that's, otherwise, yeah. I, you know, they don't have, there's no, their, uh, their bills are, there's nothing fancy about the, uh, the, the tooth-like projections on their bill. They don't have anything, they're crack anything open. So they depend right. upon the gizzard to grind it. So. Right. Mentioning the bill again, do, do all these puddle ducks pretty much have like what you described for the, uh, for the shoveler, um, they, they're basically tooth-like yes. lamellae. Yeah, almost uh, all of them. Like comb-like. Uh. Yes, most of them. Almost all of them. The only, the only ducks really that in the um, 
that really divert from that tooth-like uh, projections is going to be your, like your mergansers, which are going to be into more of the, uh, you know, the shark type teeth to hold, to hold fish. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh -huh. Okay. So that, that was the last. So that was the eight puddle ducks that, that you're likely to see. So now we're going to look at the diver. So, you know, you, you're looking at birds out in the water. You're seeing them go underwater instead of just tipping or, or feeding on the surface. You know, okay, it looks like divers. I'm seeing a lot of black and white. So let's try to figure out what we're, what we're looking at. These are the seven most common divers, the golden eye, and there are two of them. So you can actually say there are eight. Uh, the golden eye, the bufflehead, the scop, there's two of those as well. Ringneck duck, hooded merganser, the common merganser, and the ruddy duck. So these are the, the common divers in, in the area. The habitats, where are you gonna find them? Large rivers are very good habitat for diving ducks. So, you know, if you go down to Sundial Bridge, um, a lot of those ducks out there are going to be divers. It's probably one of the places you're going to see about 60% divers and, you know, maybe 40% puddle ducks. But there are, there are a lot of divers there. And then up in the big reservoirs, like up in uh, Shasta Lake, any deep water type freshwater bays, um, Orville, you know, dam, any of these big water impoundments are going to have diving ducks as, as one of their most predominant birds that are there. So let's look at these and try to figure out how to tell them apart. We'll start with the bufflehead, the smallest of the diving ducks. Very common, all right? There's a lot of these here. Um, the head um, of, the, of the male bufflehead is, is, I mean, it's rounded with a big white patch on the back of the head, right? So it's this big white patch really shows up well. The rest of the head is an iridescent kind of a color. Um, it can go from a dark green purple to almost black looking. The bill is, is a solid blue basically. And the rest of the body is all white on the belly and black on the top. In fact, I, I was thinking, you know, when you see them in a distance, they're almost like half and half, 50-50, half black, half white. Okay. Um, really fast wing beat. Um, I'm going to just note the pink feet here for just a second because it'll become important in another slide. But um, the pink feet of the, of the buffle head are pretty unique to the buffle head. So I'll add that in as one of the identifying field characteristics. The female, the female isn't, doesn't have as much white. It's a lot of gray colored, dark gray and light gray. The head, instead of the big white patch that you have behind the eye, it's just like a little streak, a little thumb streak. Like somebody dipped their thumb in white paint and just kind of made a little strike right, right below the eye. Um, very small duck. So a small, compact little duck that you see diving underwater, okay? When it takes flight, it's black and white, small bird with a fast wing beat. You're looking at a bufflehead. The next black and white bird that's almost 50-50 black and white, but much bigger than the bufflehead is going to be the golden eye. So your golden eye are very common out on the, on the river there. Um, in fact, this, this photo here was taken on the Sacramento River on one of the, one of the Wintu uh, Audubon tours. And um, it was cool because it caught the two subspecies or a species, not subspecies, a species of golden eye, the barrows golden eye here and the common golden eye right here. And so to tell the two males apart, it's fairly easy. Um, one, of the, one of the things to look for is the shape of the white spot on the face. The common has a round, a round shape and the barrows has more of a teardrop type shape to it. Okay. Um, in order to remember which is which, just remember the more common shape is round. So the round spot is going to be found on the common golden eye. The barrow's golden eye, again, a teardrop type shape to it. Um, there's more white in the common than there is in the barrows. But one thing that really stands out, and, and I didn't see this for a lot of years, in fact, until I came up to Shasta County and was able to see a number of barrow's golden eye, because I wasn't able to ever see them out in the field much. I, when I grew up in the Bay Area, um, you know, I didn't see golden eye that often. But look at this notch right here on the side. You notice that on the common golden eye, it's, there's all white in here. And on the barrows, you have this black notch that comes down into the body. And that really helps um, when you're, you're not quite sure on the patch because the duck's looking away from you. 
Um, that really is a good diagnostic feature on the males. The female golden eye right here um, are a lot closer looking. They're, they're harder to tell apart. And a lot of it has to do with the, with the bill, okay? The, um, the common golden eye, mostly, <laughs> unfortunately, there's a, like a 5%, you know, lap over between these. But most of the time, the common golden eye hen has a black bill with just a little tip of yellow towards, towards the tip of the bill, where the Barrow's golden eye is more of an orange color and it's mostly the entire bill that's covered. Okay, so that's the color is one, is one tip. Uh, the other thing is, if you, if you can kind of look at the, the shape of this, this is a much more stunted or shorter bill than you're gonna find on the common. This is more elongated, a little bit more narrow here, and this is thicker and shorter. Okay, so the, the barrel's golden eye and mostly orange bill, a short stubbier bill, the common, uh, a longer thinner bill, and usually just a little white at the, at the tip of the bill. I threw this one in just because it's like, wait a minute, that looks like a hen, but it's got a, it's got a white spot on it. That, that can throw you off. It's like, what, what are you looking at here? This is just a, uh, a young male golden eye. So the white dot is gonna tell you it's a male because the females are always all brown, okay? But the brown head, instead of the classic dark green, purple, black color that you're gonna see, is gonna be brown on that first and second year golden eye, and it'll, it'll change over to the more classic on its third year. So if you see one like that, don't, don't get confused just because it's got a brown head. Look at that spot and telling you that, it, that it's a male. Hey, Mike. Yes. I wanted, I wanted to add the fact that uh, the Barrow's golden eye can most commonly be seen um, on the Sacramento River right across from the rodeo grounds uh, parking area there. Yeah. They, seem to, they seem to gather there for whatever reason. Yeah, great. And, and it's worth going down there to look at them because they're, they're a beautiful duck. And uh, getting, getting to see them out in the field really, really helps a lot in identifying them. Now, remember I talked about the pink fit, foot? See, sometimes you're looking at a duck in your binoculars and you see this blob of black and white and you're going, what is that? But all of a sudden it comes up to scratch its face and you see this pink. What, what duck had the pink foot? Buffalo head. Buffalo head. So there's a buffalo can... head that snuck in. There's, there's one swimming along, but that's buffalo head kind of snuck into the photo. And I thought, well, that's really cool to show the importance sometimes of a, of a color like that pink foot that'll go, oh, well, that, that's a buffalo head. It can't be a gold mine, so. And when those yeah. buffalo head come in for a landing, you can really see those pink legs sticking out. Oh there. yeah, they're huge, right? And they spread them out and <laughs> they really show up well. So those are your golden eye. Now, the scop, these are probably, in my opinion, telling the greater and lesser scop apart is probably the hardest of all these ducks altogether. Um, there are certain things to look for. I'm gonna point them out, but I'll tell you, it's not easy because it's, it's kind of like you gotta train your eye to look for it, okay? So the scop, two of, two of the species we have, we have a greater scop and a lesser scop, all right? So this photo has, a greater up here and a lesser scop below it. All right, so let's let's start out with the, the size. The greater scop is larger, so that helps with remembering greater is bigger, okay? The greater scop has more white colored feathering, especially on the flanks, if you notice this, but it's not 100% of the time. <laughs> but most of the time, it's got more white or greater amount of white than the lesser scop has. It's a little bit more mottled in gray, okay? So that's another field characteristic. The next thing is going to be looking at the shape of the head. All right. Now, if you if you look at this big, really oval oblong, and that's not oblong, but it's an oval, almost round shape compared to this that has a little bit of a kind of a point right here. It's got a little bit of an odd shape, more, I guess, a higher crest, a little bit pointed in the back of the head there. This, the lesser scop doesn't have the big, robust, rounded shape head that the greater scop has, okay? Both of them have an all blue bill. The tips of the bill, this is getting really into, if you got a spotting scope and you're looking at them for a long time, but a lesser scop 
has a narrower bill with the black right on the nail, very limited to just the nail, the tip of the nail, where the greater scop has a wider bill and the black actually goes past the nail and is also on the, the outside edges of the bill. So it's not as like a little tip of black, but it actually is, is almost like the entire front end of that bill is, is black. So that's another characteristic. People talk about narrow, um, the narrow shape of the head compared to a wider shape on the greater scalp. Okay, so these are all like little things to look for, but not always easy to tell. In flight, it's a little, actually, a little bit easier if you can see the wings open because the, um, the secondaries on a lesser scalp are white, but they go to a gray color immediately into the primaries. On the greater scalp, the white, here's where the secondaries end. The white continues out into the greater, uh, the primaries. So you're gonna have a greater amount of white that goes beyond this, the secondary feathers out into the primaries, okay? So more white on the wing, a wider bill, more black on the tip, and then more white on the side. Those are the key points to look at when you're uh, trying to identify the greater and lesser scalp. Okay, the, uh, the hens, again, not easy to tell apart. They're a brown bird with a white patch between the eye and the bill, okay? Um, but look again at the head. Here's that big kind of bulbous shaped head. And this one, you see a look, like a little peak to the, to the shape back here, just like this duck here, right? It's not, it's not as big and, and rounded as the greater Scott. Uh, a little bit more of a peak to the to the shape of the head. Those are the best field characteristics that, that I can point out for you. Um, we're about to look at a another duck that's similar to these, and that's the ring neck duck. And one thing to look for if you're trying to determine do do I have a a scop or a ring neck is look at the back of these ducks. They are not pure black. They look like um, they've been dusted with snow. Basically, they have white feathering or speckles along the top. And you'll see when you come to the ring neck, the back is completely solid black. Okay, so that, that's a good field characteristic as well. And here we go, here's your ring neck duck. So notice the back feathers here on the male, completely black, there's no white in there at all. So if you see that on it, it's like you got a, you got a ring neck immediately. It's not, it's not a scot. The ring neck duck is actually named because there is a, act actual ring around this bird's neck between um, the head and the chest, there's a dark vermilion colored ring. But it's almost impossible to see it. So the, a lot of times people why, ask, why not call it a ring bill duck, right? And then they, they are called ring bills in some places because there is a white ring that goes around this entire bill. The scop had a solid blue bill. Now you're looking at a duck that you can see this white ring. And it shows up really well, especially this portion of it. So white ring all the way around the bill, that is a ring neck duck, okay? And I think if you call it a ring bill, you're not gonna be all that far off. It shows up even on the hens, there's a white ring that goes around that bill. Um, the shape of the head, it's, it's kind of tends towards more like that lesser scop look, you know, a little bit more peaked in the back. Um, but the, the ring neck, the, I think this white eye ring with a little trail of white that comes off of it is pretty diagnostic of the, of the hens. They tend to have more of a chocolatey color uh, to them than the, than the Scott do. These are brown, kind of a mottled brown. You look at these, you kind of see like a chocolate color in them. I, I see that on the field pretty, pretty easily. And the, black, the back is blacker on, on the ring necks. So there's your ringneck ducks um, on the wing. When these, when you open up a wing of a ringneck, instead of the white that you see on the scot, that is replaced with a um, a metal gray colored speculum. There's no white at all. It's all dark gray across the uh, across the wing. Okay, and then we get the ruddy duck. So the ruddy duck is the smallest of uh, of our diving ducks. Um, Similar in size to the buffle head, you know, a little bit bigger. It's an all solid colored bird. You're gonna not see it um, 
this coloration until the springtime. Most of the time, what we're going to see is this brownish, um, really stubby little, little duck with a little darker cap on the males. Um, the thing that that is most diagnostic about these ducks is they have a um, a little flat tail or a stiff tail that they will actually hold up. I'm going to show you on the screen. Instead of flat down on the water, they will actually pick up their tail and hold it straight up into the air well, like that when a lot of times when they're swimming around. And they are, they are a member of the stiff-tailed duck family. The duck tail on a ruddy duck is just like a woodpecker type of a tail. We think about you know what the woodpecker tail looks like and they hold it against a tree to balance themselves. Well, it's that spiky kind of a tail that you're gonna find on the ruddy duck. These ducks would rather swim around than fly. Most of the time when you see them, they're swimming by, or if they take flight, it's usually not for very long, very low, right over the top of the water, and then they land again. They, they're not one that you see high in the sky, you know, migrating by. Um, they are the duck, the one duck that reverses its colorful plumage. So when all the other ducks are, be, are going into their, um, with their molt or their eclipse plumage, the ruddy duck is in reverse. They go from an all brown looking drab duck to this reddish cinnamon colored duck with white cheek patches and a bright blue bill. And they're actually gorgeous, but you don't see them very often because most of the time they're not here during their breeding season. Um, they're, they're gone uh, in the late spring when they start to turn. I saw some of these in my short time in, uh, in Nevada uh, because they, they were using the, the waterways around where I was living and they would come up around around late March, April, and they'd be in this red color and they, they were uh, really beautiful at that time of year. Um, the bill, it's all solid color, either gray or turning bright blue later when they're in this color here. Okay, then we go into the mergansers, which are still ducks, okay, still waterfowl, but kind of in, in a separate category. The mergansers all have that, um, that long thin bill with the sharp tooth-like projections on the side because they are fish feeders, okay, fish eaters. The hooded merganser is one of the freshwater mergansers. These will hang around in freshwater ponds. You'll find them in Sacramento at the, at the refuge. This is one of the more common ones you'll see there where the, the mergansers that you see on the Sacramento River are more of the deep, deeper diving type ducks. So we'll look at those next. Those are the common mergansers. Uh, it has that serrated bill. The large hood on the male is, I mean, you're just not going to mistake it for anything. It has similar coloration to the buffalo head, but it has a huge hood. This thing um, it really shows up well. And when they're in flight, they just fold it back and you can actually see it. Um, you can still see the hood. It's just folded back. You can see it a little bit better here on the hen. Um, the, the hen is basically all brown, but it still has the hood. All right, that, that little uh, hairdo that it has is very diagnostic. The bill, black on the, uh, the male, um, and orange with some black markings on the female. But again, the, the really thin razor-like um, thin bill with the serrated uh, type uh, lamellae are, are gonna be the easiest thing to tell apart. In flight, they kind of have a shape of a wood duck with this big, big tail and the uh, the general shape a wood duck has, but you're going to see the white markings on the wing, and you'll pick up that hood if they're if they're close enough. So um, they're they're actually not all that hard to, to tell apart from the other ducks. The common mergansers. Now, this is what you see a lot of on the on the Sacramento River. Go down by the Sundial Bridge. You're you're going to see these. They like they like the uh, deeper upper stretches of rivers. You'll find them on um, Shasta Lake on the big lagoons, you know, anything with big open water. They have a large red serrated bill that, that tooth-like projections. Um, green head on the male and the body is basically all white on the belly side. The top has some black, but these are, they're huge. These, these, these are very, very big ducks, much larger than a pintail or a mallard. Um, the male, you'll see that green head and the red bill. I mean, you'll see them from a long ways off and you tell them apart. The female, the head is basically a reddish color, but they also have that red bill, okay? Um, I want you to look at this line where the red changes to the breast color of the gray-white 
you see how it's it's extremely defined as a red solid line and the reason i want you to look at that is the way you can tell the common merganser hen from a red-breasted merganser is is this line of demarcation between the head and the and the neck area and the chest so there's your common and down here let's look at these these are red-breasted mergansers. And again, you look at where the, the reddish color is. See, it kind of just blends into a gray. It doesn't have a, a real fine line like it did in this picture here. So that's the easiest thing to tell the hens apart. If you see a, a hen merganser and it's kind of just kind of a blended brownish color, that's most likely you're looking at a, a red-breasted merganser. So we do have some other divers, uh, the redheads and canvasbacks occasionally, but extremely rare. Um, I just threw these in there just to kind of, if you're interested to show you the, uh, the redhead and canvasback are the two divers that have the reddish colored heads. To, the, the main difference between the redhead and the canvasback is the bill shape. The canvasback has a sloping, um, a sloping long, large sloping bill where the redhead, it's a more abrupt on the forehead, and then it's a shorter bill and it's blue with a black tip as opposed to all solid um, black. Then it goes into, they both have a black chest, but the canvas back, okay, the body is, is a very light colored, um, it's all vermiculated feathers, which are fine wavy lines on white. And this color, the canvas of an artist canvas is one of the theories of where it got its name because the entire bird has got that canvas color look to it. Okay, where the redhead is more of a gray, gray body and then you get into the black rump. But um, not very common, you, you, you'll see them occasionally. Lake um, over in Oroville, I've, I've seen them at the, in the after bay occasionally, uh, usually late December and January but um, I have not seen many of them like around Shasta County and certainly not down on the refuges, though if you get into big open water, occasionally you'll see some. So those are your divers. And then we're gonna finish up with the geese. So a lot easier, we only have five species we're working with here. Um, five most common, the Canada goose, the cackling goose, snow goose, Ross's goose, and the white fronted goose, right? So that's, uh, here's a picture taken at Sac Refuge and hopefully, you guys are going to be seeing that here shortly um, as they're staging down in the in the valley. So we'll start with the Canada goose. Most common of, of all the geese, they're you know all over the United States and Canada. Um, very very large goose, by far much larger than the uh, other species. You find them in golf courses and parks. A lot of them have gotten to be where they don't even migrate anymore. They just kind of hang around, and they're like local populations of these geese. Back in the um, 70s and early 80s, um, they used to break down the Canada geese into 12 subspecies of Canada geese. And that changed here several years ago now, probably over 10 years ago now. And now they break them up into Canada geese and cackling geese. So there's only now two uh, groups of, of geese and they've separated the two to Canada's and cacklers. So I'm gonna start with the Canada goose, right? Um, you've all seen these. They have their classic honking sound, um, very large, light colored chest, but the black neck and head with a white cheek patch is uh, diagnostic of the, of the Canada geese. And I got to throw this in there, right? Because people do this all the time. And in order to tell the difference between a Canada goose and a Canadian goose, is the Canadian goose largely going to be found on back of a horse wearing a Mountie cap? carrying a Canada flag and it has nothing to do with that. And unfortunately, a week and a half ago, the Department of Fish and Wildlife on Facebook posted a flock of Canada geese and labeled them Canadian geese. And they took a beating and I added to that beating and said, you're an embarrassment. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Don't do that. They are Canada geese, all right? So they, it's not a nationality that you're calling them. Um, that, it is a Canada goose. So that's something that uh, was ingrained in me back when I, in my Humboldt days, back in the seventies, um, that you never do that. You should never do that in your entire career. And so I had to add this slide in there because I found somebody, I saw this drawing online one day and went, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> you really bring it home that it's, they're not Canadian. Thanks for making that point. <laughs> right. 
Now here's your cackling geese, all right? So now, now that we're breaking them into only the large and the small, all right? So the cackling geese are, it's much easier to, um, to say, okay, I've got a cackler or a cackling goose or not a Canada goose. Look at them here when they're side by side, all right? Much smaller, but, but similar in coloration. Um, you know, they both have the, the black head and neck with a white cheek patch. They both have that same brownish uh, tans and grays in the body with a white rump, okay? But the differences are gonna be in two places, well, three places. One is size, they're much smaller. So it's a small, compact goose. It's got a really short, stubby bill. If you look at the difference between the, the ratio of the bill to the head of this bird down here, the cackling, and the Canada goose here, you see that it's a much stubbier bill. And overall, the, the bird is much darker. It's, the body has is, is got more of that chocolatey color to it. Um, and I'll tell you what, the other thing is they don't honk. They don't have that honking sound. They bark, a high-pitched bark like a little dog, basically. So if you, if you hear that classic Canada goose sound, it's a Canada goose. You see a bunch of geese that look like Canada geese, and you hear this little high-pitched whoop. It's almost like a snow goose makes more of a bark. That's a cackling goose. It's not a Canada goose. So that, that sound of that, that call is, is very diagnostic. Um, we don't see many of them in the valley, but up in, uh, in Humboldt County, Crescent City up, up there, the uh, cackling geese come down in huge numbers now. They've done really well and they had a huge comeback. Then we got the snows. Okay, so there's two white geese that we're dealing with in the valley. You got the snow goose and the Ross goose. The snow is the larger of the two. This is a photo taken again at the Sac Refuge on the, on the auto tour. And right here in the middle is a little bonus bird. This is a blue phase snow goose, all right? So it's actually a snow goose, but it has a dark phase to it. And then we call them a blue goose or a blue phase goose. On the Pacific Flyway, a very small percentage of our of our snow geese have that blue phase. When you get into the central flyways like in Texas and uh, you go, go towards the east, there's a higher population of, of, uh, of blue geese there, but, but not, in, not on the Pacific flyway, they're pretty rare. You, if you get a big flock like that first picture, you know, where you got thousands of birds, you may pick out a half a dozen in there, but that's what it's gonna take, huge concentrations of them in order to see them. And occasionally you'll see one in flight when, they, when they're going in a flock. The main thing is these are large white birds, okay, with black tip wings. They have pink feet as well, kind of, kind of close to the coloring of the of the buffalo head. But the main thing is going to be the, um, the the bill itself. And on the next picture, I'm going to show you the difference between a snow and a ross. But I did want to talk about the uh, grayer colored birds. Like so, right here where the pointer is, see this bird is a lot grayer. Um, there's one here. Those are just uh, young of the year, first year snows. They will get whiter the next next season when they when they come down. Now, look looking at the bills. Here's a snow goose, and here's a Ross's goose. And if you look at the the bill, the uh, snow goose has a what they call a grin patch, where the top and the bottom bill don't come together in a in a fine line like it does here on the Ross. It actually has a um, it's almost like somebody's grinning at you or, you know, has that little uh, grin, grin patch. It's, it's um, how am I going to describe it other than they don't come together together and it's all black. Here on the Ross, the top and the bottom of the, the bills come together in a straight line. And a large percentage of the Ross, Ross's geese have um, warding um, along the base of the bill where you don't see that on the snow goose. They're, they're smooth skin all the way to the, to the face. The shape of the head is, is also different. If you look at these two, this is more oblong here, more like an egg shape, where the Ross goose is, is more truly round. Um, smaller body, okay, but white bird, black tip wings, yep. Um, but again, the, the bill and the shape of the head are the, are the two things. When, a lot of times, if you see big flights of white geese going over the valley, you will see a few very small birds in the middle of a big flock and you're looking at a few Ross geese that have joined a, a flock of snow geese in, in a lot of those. But that's the main thing that, that's gonna tell them apart is the, uh, is the bill. Okay, the last goose is the white fronted goose. 
Um, it's called a white front because of the white patch on the front of its face. So between the eye and the bill, you got a white patch, okay? That's where it gets the name white front. Kind of interesting that it's not on the chest area, but it's in the, on the facial area. It has an orange to pinkish um, bill, but um, otherwise it's kind of a, it's a brown bird with, with black speckling on the belly. Now, the black barring starts out as almost nothing. In fact, the first year white fronts are just all grayish brown in the, in the belly. And then this is probably a, a second year bird. It's starting to get a little bit of black spots and they will continue until this belly becomes completely black. And so um, you will hear these referred to as speckle bellies because of the black speckling on, on the chest. Okay, so that's kind of their, one of their common names. Um, they have a high pitched double note call to them. You'll hear these are, they're very easy to tell apart um, from, from the honk of the, can the Canada geese, the honkers, right? And then the, the, the pitch, high pitch sound of a, of a snow goose or a, or a cackling goose. This has a, um, a two note call. I don't know if I can do it without a call in my hand, but it's, it's kind of like a, it's a double, double note. It has a double note to it um, instead of a single note. So that helps when they're flying over to tell them apart. Hey, Mike, we had a couple of questions okay. on, on um, the Aleutian goose. Yes. Okay. The Aleutian uh, is actually going to be uh, lumped in with the cackling geese now. It's the largest of the cackling subspecies. Remember, they, they used to be 12, right? So um, the Aleutian goose is, is in the cackling group, uh, goose group because it's got the smaller bill in relation to its, its body and it's a darker, darker bird. So they're lumped in with cackling geese. The Aleutian goose, one of the things about the Aleutian is that in about 90% of the Aleutian geese, they have an extra white bar between the black neck and the chest. There's an extra band of white here. But one of the things that's a problem when we were uh, in enforcement, we're trying to figure these out when Aleutian geese were, were completely protected, they aren't no longer. Um, the Aleutian goose, 90% had a white bar. Well, on the cackling geese or the, the old cackler, 10% of them had a white bar, right? So it's like a small goose with a short bill and a white bar, it's like, what do you have? Well, <laughs> you gotta measure the bill to tell them apart, right? So that made it really difficult. Now they just kind of lumped them together as cackling geese. So that's what they've done with them. For now, that's probably gonna change in a few years, right? <laughs> Typical <laughs> classification of birds. The three swans, that we have, um, the tundra or whistling swan is the most common. Um, when you see them out in the field with good pair of binoculars or spotting scope, you can pick out this yellow patch there on the, uh, on the upper part of the bill. The, uh, the trumpeter swan is a much bigger swan, but again, it's relative. So unless you see them side by side, it's hard to tell. But instead of uh, that yellow patch, they have a dark blue, if you see it at all, um, patch of, of feathering bright, up on the upper part of that bill, but it's a much larger bill and it's and they're much more rare than, uh, than the whistling or tundra swans. And then the mute swans, which unfortunately are becoming more common. These are an invasive species. Um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is, is very uh, concerned that they don't want them to start mating and crossbreeding with the other swans. So there is a, they're, they're trying to get rid of them if it's possible. And uh, the, I know that where possible, if they show up on a refuge, they're probably not gonna be there that long because these are a highly invasive swan and it can actually, um, can hurt the other swans if they, if they were able to crossbreed with them. But uh, the mute swans, you've seen them, they're decorative swans with the big feathers that are on the wings that they can prop up. That, that bill area though is, I mean, you're not gonna confuse it with any of the others if you can see the beak, okay? Then just, Couple of things more out of interest than anything. People have asked me, you know, how do you count waterfowl, right? It's like, oh, well, if it's a small flock like this, you know, it's like, oh, that's not hard. Three, four, five, six, six, seven of them. Okay, that's cool. Let's go a little bit bigger. Now, when you get a flock like this one here in the middle, now how do you count them? Because remember, they're going by at 35 miles an hour, right? So what they do in the field is usually you pick a group of birds and you try to count how many ducks are like right here. And you just count that group. And then you see how many of those groups are there in this, in this flock. 
And I and I did this. I tried this like several times the other day, and I and I had like ten birds here that I counted, and then went okay, 10, 20, 30, eh, 40, almost fifty is what I'd say, close to that. So you're looking at the size of the group, right? So you can see how you can take that group and then dump it over the top of these, and you have to add more to make it. And, and that's how they do it. So that you're counting a small area and extrapolating it over and you're going, okay, about 50 on a, on a flock like that. But then you get into something like this where the whole refuge erupts and you go, uh, okay, how do they count birds like this when they're doing waterfowl surveys on an airplane and the whole flock takes off? And quite honestly, this is done through estimations, okay? No, what you need to have is the same person year after year doing the counts and what they'll do is the counters will actually study pictures of large groups of birds and they know what the count is. Somebody has actually given them the count and they will look at that group and they'll look at a bird, you know, with, with a thousand birds and one with 500 birds. And they just kind of go, okay, when I see that group, that's how many I see there. Okay. And when they do their counts, they are just estimating based on what their mind picture is showing. And so what you're actually getting is an indicator or an indice of how many birds there are. It's not an actual count, right? Because what they're doing is last year to this year, did the population go up or down? And what they're doing is comparing by having the same person do the count year after year, you get a pretty good indication of whether the populations are going up, down, or staying the same. And so that's kind of just in general how, how waterfowl are counted. And I Throw this in here just as a kind of fun deal, since I'm in Hawaii giving you this. Um, we have a few species of waterfowl in Hawaii that are unique to Hawaii. And this one here, these are nene geese or the Hawaiian goose, okay? And these have um, probably come from a Canada goose lineage at some point. As you can see, it has similarities. The body colors are very similar, but instead of just a white patch on the cheek, the white head has turned, it's more cream colored. And it, is, and it has gone all the way down into the base of the neck. They kind of have a, a small honking sound though. So these are, are Hawaii's goose and uh, those are nenes. And this next one, I'm saving the best one for last, but this, <laughs> this one down here, this is the Hawaiian goose and it looks like a mallard um, in a lot of ways. And again, it's believed that they were probably, um, they came from a mallard family, but the Hawaiian goose, there's only one, one of the islands here, I believe it's Kauai, um, that has a pure strain left. The other islands, like here, on, I live on the big island, they're all mixed with, uh, with domestic mallards now. They, they've unfortunately got into, that, into their bloodlines and most of them are mixed. But the true Hawaiian duck, it looks like a little smaller than our mallards, much darker overall coloration, okay? More, um, definitely a darker color all over. And it's got a white, a white eye ring, a small one, but it, but it does show up. And um, the males and females look alike. They, they are, um, they're not like the green heads on, on our mallards and the brown on the hen mallards. So these are the Hawaiian duck, the Koloa Maoli. And this one here, I would not have had a picture of except Nicole just got back from Midway Atoll. And in Midway, it's one of the two places you can find these ducks. And these are laysan ducks. Used to be called laysan teal. All the things I see now call them laysan ducks. They're small as our teal. Um, and they're only found on Midway um, and laysan Island. And so on the Northwest Hawaii Islands. And uh, Nicole just was sharing her pictures with me as she got back today. And uh, there are, there's a healthy population of them there and very few people get to see them in person. So that's kind of a cool fact to uh, end my presentation. With. So. That's what I got. And hopefully that gives you some things that'll help you in identifying the birds out in the field. Very cool, Mike. That's, that's a heck of a lot of information. Does anybody um, have any questions that they weren't able to ask uh, during the presentation? Um, probably be a good time to ask. Just too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of information, boy. A lot of information. A really wonderful presentation, Mike. That oh, was nice. terrific. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. Yeah, I took a whole lot of notes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, okay. 
I hope that I can um, uh, review all that stuff. Like somebody asked the question, um, yeah, the, this uh, is recorded and it will be, I will uh, yeah. be putting it on our YouTube site uh, okay. as soon as this is over, I'll start. I just don't know how long it'll take to upload it, but tonight or tomorrow morning, it'll be, uh, it'll be available. What I recommend uh, if, you're, if you're new to, to Duck ID is get an identification book go through the recording and then just highlight the two or three things on each species that stands out mm -hmm. about that species. And then when you get out in the field, always look with your binoculars to see as much as you can. And then once you know, you start knowing what a species is, then drop the binoculars down and see how much of that you can still see without the binoculars. And eventually you'll start being able to say, hey, I could tell those were widgeon and they're like 400 yards away. But you see them first up close and pick out the things that you need to see and then look at them again when they're far away. And that'll start helping you pick out the little things that'll that'll show up from long distances. So hopefully that'll help you. Yeah, that's a that's a really good tip because um, you know, I find I find when we're out birding, uh, most of the problems are like you said, we see a flock of ducks fly over. I mean, they yeah. could be they could be a hundred yards away, they could be more than a hundred yards away. And right. you know, like you said, they're going 35 miles an hour, right? <laughs> right. You so, don't have you know, so we get a brief <laughs> look at them and to look to, to finally, um, hopefully ingrain in your own head what those, the, the, the wing patterns and the white and the dark and, the, and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, if, if, if we can get that in our heads, uh, we'll, be, we'll be much, much better birders. It really, it, it really starts becoming more comfortable the more you're out in the field looking with the binoculars and then looking without, you know, and, and just seeing a really fast wing beats of a diver. You'll see how much faster the wing's beating than a, than a puddle duck. And you go, oh, wow, that, that's a diver. Okay, I got that. And then what can I see of that with the binoculars, you know? And you might not be able to see a lot, but if you pick up, oh, it's a really small duck and it's got a lot of black and white, and it's, you know, probably a bufflehead or a golden eye. Right. So then was it real small or was it was it bigger? And, and those things will start coming to you. And eventually it's like, oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> but it takes it takes time um, in the field to, to get there. But that's what okay. makes birds fun. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, and I probably should mention the fact that uh, um, on the 21st, if it's not pouring rain, we'll be taking a trip down to Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, if you check, if you look in the chat, you'll notice that Trish Ford, um, our our education chair, has a Clover Creek Preserve um, trip tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And it's supposed to not be raining. There's Trish. Um, I'm just I'm just overloaded with information. <laughs> <laughs> well. I know it's a lot, but you have it recorded, so that that'll help me being able to go back to it. But um, in order to cover, you know, that basically you're looking at about 16 species of ducks. Uh, I didn't want. I went pretty fast, but I tried to give you the key points, and that you know, it's just hard, right? Because there's yeah. a lot of information that that's out there. So, so anybody... I especially I especially like the way you said, okay, there's these two types of ducks. Don't pay any attention. If it's a diving duck, don't bother with the puddle ducks. So that helps me um, narrow it down so I'm not flipping through 3,000 pages of books trying to find yeah. things. You know? Eight's a lot easier than seven. Yeah. Three, you know? yeah. <laughs> That's a helpful strategy. Good. Yeah, well, also we are uh, finding more blue wing teals. Um, I mean, when, when we go looking at, at the wildlife refuges, I always... Um, okay tell people to look for blue wing teals. Uh, and uh, we we have found them in several places. Uh, yeah, raised are, hand, yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, you're muted. I think you're muted. You need to unmute, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, you need to unmute. There you go. Any, hi, hi. Uh, any of the migrating birds from California to Hawaii? Yes, um, actually, um, let's see, we have 
We have pintail that show up in, in Hawaii. Um, we're talking like four or five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> green winged teal, uh, the, we see a few of them. Um, lesser scop are probably one of the more common migrants here. We, we've got about a dozen of them now in one of our sewer treatment plants. So just like everywhere else, they tend to be good burning spots. Um, there's one bufflehead on the island. Everybody's going crazy over it, driving over the hill to go look at it. So, <laughs> you know, we get occasional um, uh, birds, but I would say, yeah, a pintail, green wing teal, a, a scop, and, and, a, and a few, uh, once in a while, widgeon, you know. So uh, is that, so is that a... Uh uh annual migrating route or just periodic freak route you know that we don't they're not banded or, or radio uh, tagged so we don't know if it's the same birds but i'll tell you I've, so i've been here three three winters now and we always see those species in small numbers so maybe it's the same ones that keep coming back or is it coincidence that there's storms that occur and a small percentage of them show up here but it seems like maybe you know they have decided I'd rather spend my winter in eighty degree weather than to, than to fight the snow through the valley. So yeah, uh, I don't know. And until they're tagged or radio, uh, you know, telemetry or something, we're, we're not going to know. So is there a flyway from here to Hawaii then? Flyway? I, I wouldn't say no. It, it's a it's a rarity. It, it okay. you know it does happen, but yeah, I would you can't call it a flyway. We did. In no, late November, yeah, in late November, I was down, uh, Nicole was was canoeing or doing the uh, out, outrigger canoeing, and I was down in the bay just kind of taking photos, and uh, I saw a duck, and, and, and it's like, wow, that looks like a long-tailed duck. They've been reported one other time on the big island, and so I went down to the shoreline, and I'm looking at it and going, you know, I called Nicole over because she was in a boat, and I go, go paddle out there and Get a picture of that. I think it's a long tailed duck. She goes, No, yeah, it can't be. And she goes out there and she goes, Oh my God. So she takes these pictures and brings it back. And it was, it was a it was a male long tailed duck that showed up. And I, I threw it on the little bird hotline and we had half the biologists in the island there in about two hours. <laughs> so it uh, it had only been um recorded one other time on the big island and uh, i think like three or four times on any of the hawaiian islands so that was a that was a good rarity but that was kind of cool mm -hmm. unfortunately the duck landed up getting hooked by our fishermen swallowing a, a bait and we had to get it to a wildlife center and it didn't make it it landed up um it was so emaciated probably just from it being lost and going you know that three thousand miles that it was out of its way and uh it didn't make it through, but it was a, it was an interesting duck to see. So. Mm -hmm. That would be, a, um, that would be a life for, for me. Yeah. Uh, with those yeah. ducks, with those ducks that the puddle ducks that make it across the ocean to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wonder, do you have any speculation? Do you think they sit down and dabble on the ocean surface along the way? I don't think so. Yeah. I bet they make that, that flight right like back to California. Um, yeah. It's it, it's amazing some of the species that are here. The little uh, uh, Pacific Golden Plover, um, one of the plovers, it, it routinely migrates from Alaska to Hawaii nonstop in three days. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, you know, this tiny little bird, right? And, and amazing what they can do. So yeah. I think the ducks are probably coming off the California coast, probably closest line. Mm -hmm. Aren't they flying against the wind going in that direction? <laughs> that would be, yeah, that would be even more difficult. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't think they land on the ocean. I really don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't really have any mechanism to, you know, to filter out salt water, like, you know, the sure waters and mm -hmm. the ocean going birds. So mm -hmm. I don't know how they do that. But, Amazing. Yeah, they are incredible. <laughs> No. Does any, anybody else have any other questions? I don't have any question, but today, driving south, just south of Gridley, okay. uh, there was one of the rice fields, and I don't understand why, but I guess the farmer left the rice in the field. It was a, 
uh, filled with water. Okay. And there were thousands and thousands of uh, snow geese. Snow geese, yeah. Just in that one spot. I did yeah. not see it prior to that point. And then I did not see it past that point going to the Sacramento airport. Okay. But there were just thousands and thousands of them. Some were airborne and some were on the water. Okay. You know, they, they tend to um, find a spot and, and stay there for four or five days and get their fill and then uh, move to another spot and <laughs> take over that field. And this year, without many uh, rice farmers putting rice in, most of the rice was grown on the, uh, the east side of the valley. Um, so they're holding more geese, I think, than the west side is this, this year. But normally it's pretty evenly distributed, you know, so right. once that was the rice fields, it's uh, food on. Yeah, I was on the east side of the, uh, okay. of the I-5. Uh, okay. What is it? Uh, I can't, uh, Richfield. Oh, I was yeah. I there by Richfield. And I, I was riding a rice combine. And he was uh, sharing the information. Okay. And of course, lots of the perimeter rice uh, in a paddy aren't harvested because they can't get to it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Those geese will stick around all the way into April sometimes, you know, before they head north. So. Well, you know, are you aware that the... Uh, Geese Festival is going on in uh, Chico, I believe, this coming week or soon. This week, the Snow Goose Festival. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. it's uh, starts the twenty first or right. something. It's in yeah. a week or so. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I've been to it before. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. Unless there's more questions, I'm I'm probably going to stop the recording here. Yeah.